Thank you for joining iMead. This meeting is now being recorded. Thank you very much for joining us today for the AABIP web, uh, webinar series. My name is David Shaw, and on behalf of my co-moderator, Russ Miller, and myself, we want to thank you for joining us today. Before we get started, we want to alert the audience that this webinar will be recorded and available for future viewing on the AABIP website. In, additional, uh, in addition, the AABIP does not endorse specific technologies or products. And lastly, that the contents of this presentation represent the opinions of the speaker who is our invited expert and not necessarily that of the AIP as an organization. I am going to go ahead and load our slides for our speaker today. And I would like to thank Dr. Michael Machuzak for joining us today. He is the medical director and, uh, at the Center for Major Airway Diseases and Transplant Center at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. And as anybody who knows Mike knows is that a lot of us have titles, but uh, Mike transcends all the titles that he has, and he brings a lot of expertise to our topic today. So at this point, I'm going to pass control to Mike and turn the time over to him. All right, thank you, David, and uh, thanks for the uh, two kind introduction. So we're going to talk a little bit about lung transplant and aphthomotic complications today. Uh, but before I start, I just wanted to uh, just pass on some condolences. For those of you that know Atul Mehta, uh, he recently lost his mother. Um, so um, he, he may not be able to make this call today, but I wanted him to know that the entire IP community was thinking about him and his family. Uh, so on that note, we'll... We'll start going and, and talking a little bit about uh, lung transplant complications here. So a uh, little bit about airway complications. We're going to talk about the incidence, a little bit about the significance of complications, the types of complications we see, the etiology, as well as the management. We'll talk a little bit about the workup and, and complications related to what we do to try and fix these issues. And uh, there weren't a whole lot of lung transplant jokes out there, so that's about the best I could do on this one. Uh, airway complications. So what is an airway complication? We're going to focus primarily on necrosis, dehiscence, stricture, or stenosis. And that's going to include uh, the standard scar formation, the vanishing bronchus syndrome, as well as uh, granulation tissue or exophytic uh, inflammatory tissue at the anastomotic area. We'll talk a little bit about dynamic collapse and malacia and uh, touch on the infectious complications as well. So let's just start out with one quick question. You guys can type it into the text box down in the bottom left-hand corner. So which of the following statements is most correct about airway complications after a lung transplant? That they occur in 60 to 80 percent of the recipients. The most common one is malacia. They're in 10 to 20 percent of the recipients. And there's an associated mortality of 2 to 4 percent or they play little or no role in lung transplant outcome. And we'll try and keep things moving along, so uh, get an answer in there quickly, and then we'll move on to the next part. So I'm seeing a lot of what looks to be uh, the right answer coming through there with C, and we'll just move on uh, to that one. So uh, the answer of 60 to 60 to 80 percent was not just picked out of thin air. In the beginning of lung transplant, that's actually where the complication rates were. Uh, we've been fortunate to have improved surgical techniques, better protocols, better post-op care antibiotic, uh, anti-rejection medicines, and uh, folks that have developed an interest in airways. So all of that has led to a much lower rate of complications. If you look through the literature um, in the 90s to the 2000s uh, up into the most recent, there's really a wide range. There's numbers reported as low as 1.6 and as high as 1 out of 3. In the largest study, which was uh, early 2000, uh, about 18% of complications, 18% of patients had complications. And I think that's what most experts would agree. It's hit somewhere around 15% of patients that come through. 
Uh, now, the significance, which was also in that question we had, is there is a, a mortality rate of 2 to 4 percent related to these airway complications. However, what's a bigger deal, if you think about why most people have a lung transplant, it's to have a better quality of life. So do they really have a better quality of life? They have to come in constantly for repeated procedures, deal with potential complications related to these procedures. Uh, so we're doing the best we can right now to minimize complications from the get-go and then to optimize how we treat them and improve overall outcomes. Uh, if we look at this slide here, now there's an awful lot that's going on in this slide. What I wanted to focus on is uh, a couple areas here. The, I think I can make this work here if I take this arrow. So if you guys pay attention right here, the average decline in an FEV1 in this study was 39%. So that's pretty substantial when you're talking about lung transplant, talking about a single lung transplant. Now, after stenting, a dramatic increase in the FEV1 of almost 90%. And it's not uncommon, most of these patients require at least a second procedure, if not more. Uh, the other important part of the slide I want to point out is that when we had airways, airway complications that we treated, there was an equivalent survival versus those that had no airway complications. When we didn't treat airway complications, there's a worse survival. So there is rationale to work on these airway complications, as you can see. Uh, additionally, if patients uh, were found to have an airway complication before their uh, discharge from the hospital, this was associated with significantly longer uh, time in the hospital. Uh, and then we have seen, as mentioned, some increased mortality. In, in this study here, there was an airway complication, those that had airway complications had mortality rates at one, three, and five years that were worse than those that had no airway complications. Uh, so, so there is some import to dealing with these complications. Uh, now we're going to go into another question, make sure you guys aren't falling asleep on me. And which of the following is most correct regarding airway complications in lung transplant recipients? The length of the donor's mechanical ventilation plays no role. A height mismatch with the taller donor being more likely to lead to airway complication. So anyone that got a lung transplant from me would be fine. Um, the type of surgical anastomosis plays no role. Or a longer donor bronchus is associated with less complications. And again, this matches into the text box down in the bottom left. Once we have a few answers thrown in there, then we'll move on. And I think we're doing okay here as well. I'm going to move on to the next slide. Uh, the height mismatch with the taller donor being more likely to lead to uh, airway complications. And this is a, a summary of a few slides. And then what I did was take out some of those I felt were most important, uh, and those also that were part of this question. So mechanical ventilation of 50 to 70 hours does play a role, and you can see the p-value there. The type of anastomosis as a telescoping anastomosis uh, plays a very large part, and we're going to talk about that in a little more detail later. And also a donor-recipient size mismatch. Uh, if someone has a previously treated airway complication, they're also more likely to have a subsequent airway complication. And we also see some evidence of both early rejection and infectious complications tying into this. One common theme, and we'll touch on this a little bit later as well, is that necrosis precedes obstruction in almost all cases. So when we talk about the etiology, some of this is data-driven, but much of it is opinion-driven, so that needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, certainly ischemia seems to be most people's uh, favorite choice as to what's causing the problems. However, immune-mediated reactions may be possible. Infections can certainly drive this, particularly aspergillus. Uh, and surgical technique, we do know, plays some role. But overall, we just don't know enough about this to, uh, to really pinpoint down where the problem comes from. Again, looking at the etiology, uh, we know we have devascularization at the anastomosis. There's no bronchial artery circulation that's established in a standard transplant. And why is that important? Because all the blood flow comes from retrograde low pressure from the pulmonary arteries. 
Now that takes time to develop. So in the early stages, we may say significant ischemia, sloughing, partial sloughing, and some of that may then remodel and lead to some of the dense strictures that we see. Uh, also, comparing tracheal anastomoses compared to bronchial anastomoses, say a heart-lung transplant that's done in block or in a bar transplant, which we'll also touch on a little later, we see a lower rate of stenosis and airway complications at, at those sites. A stress-free anastomosis just is not possible. There's wall stress from the sutures. There's wall stress from mechanical ventilation. Often there's some level of size mismatch, and all that puts pressure on a very delicate anastomosis, particularly in the early phases. It's a contaminated seal. The airway is not sterile, so infections at the site are not uncommon. Plus, many patients that we transplant are chronically colonized with many organisms, Aspergillus, Pseudomonas, and such. Uh, in a study by Herrera on the side, they talked about many possible associations as well, recipient age, BMI, steroid, underlying diseases. None of those really bore out, although many seemed to make a lot of sense, at least in that study. They did find, however, Aspergillus and airway necrosis was associated with airway complications. Again, that's a one-center study, so that needs to be kept in mind. Uh, question three, which technique has the fewest airway uh, complications? If we wrap the anastomosis with omentum, often that uh, retains the vascular supply. If we wrap the anastomosis with a pericardium, if we telescope the anastomosis, if it's an end-to-end -end anastomosis close to the secondary carina, or if we use bronchial artery revascularization. And again, answers in the text box, and we'll try and move along quickly so we can get through all the slides. So we're looking for the fewest airway complications associated with which technique. I see that Laura signed in a little while ago, so she better get this one right. We'll move on here. And there really are two answers here. The, the standard and, and really most proven answer is an end-to-end -end anastomosis close to the secondary carina. However, I'll show you some data on bronchial artery revascularization that would suggest that this is uh, a safe way and probably a low rate of complications as well. So if you look at this diagram here, what you see is the ideal spot where these dotted lines are for the anastomosis. So they want them really to be as close to that secondary crina as possible. Now that's fantastic when the airway goes well, but think about the situations where we might have to stent across this. That gives us very little landing zone, if any, and it makes our job more difficult. But by and large, this will lead to the least number of complications uh, in an airway. Excessive length is something we want to avoid. Uh, when we have excessive length of the donor bronchus, that means there's a larger area that is potentially ischemic. So if you think about it just as um, the collateral flow is going to be inversely proportional to length. So we want to have this length as short as we possibly can. And surgeons have realized that over the last uh, several years, almost a decade now, and are, are really getting uh, phenomenally uh, good at, at doing this close to the secondary carina. Uh, if we look at specific techniques, end-to-end -end compared to the anastomosis, this was from a publication a few years ago in uh, Opinions in Organ Transplant, you can see that there's no question if we telescope an anastomosis compared to an end-to-end -end anastomosis, there's a significant number of airway complications. On this axis is number of airway complications, and this is time coming across here. So end-to-end, -end, much less on the airway complication rate. And that makes sense if you just think about the way a telescoped anastomosis looks. Right from the get-go, you're starting out with a narrow lumen being sewn inside of a, a larger lumen, as opposed to an end-to-end -end where you try and keep that lumen size consistent. Uh, these next two slides are busy, but I've highlighted what I think are the most important parts. This first one is pediatric bronchial artery revascularization. And for those of you who don't know, it, it, it can be done as an on-block transplant. Uh, it's typically a tracheal anastomosis, and then the bronchial arteries are painstakingly reattach, very similar to what happens in a cabbage. Uh, so this is a procedure that can take some time. It certainly takes some level of skill. So not everyone is doing this right now. It is something that we are doing at the clinic and is being done at a couple other places. So if we look at the overall survival, uh, the overall survival was better in the group that had a bronchial artery revascularization in this group. 
And then also looking at the airway ischemic findings. There's a significant difference in the standard transplant versus those that had bar. So based on this study, basically their conclusion was airway ischemia and non-airway complications are significantly reduced when bar is combined with the tracheal anastomosis. That may lead to uh, significantly diminishing morbidity down the line for people that have airway complications. This study came out of our center, and again, the most important parts here are anastomotic intervention was required in no bar patients. Now, this was 20, 27 bar patients, uh, and then eight non-bar patients, or 15%. And again, 15% is that number that I think you'll see popping up in the literature. And, and that's typically what I quote our, our lung transplant patients when we talk about having an airway issue. This study found bar was safe, early outcomes were comparable, and that there may be some benefits, including reduced airway ischemia and complications. But however, this was a single center study, uh, so really to make uh, a larger comment about that, we need to have a multi-centered study. Now, when we're talking about airway complications, what's the typical time frame we're looking at? Is it in the first week, in the first year, after the first year? Or it doesn't really matter, they're going to develop equally over time. And again, just type in your best guess, or if you know the answer, into the text box. I'm seeing some correct answers popping up in there, so I'm not sure you And for can... people who are unsure, the text box is on the bottom left, the uh, second over from the little participants icon. And I'm seeing uh, mostly correct answers here, so we're going to move on. And you guys uh, do have it by and large less than a year. Uh, in the first year is typically when the complications develop. And down on the bottom, strictures tend to occur um, in that two to nine month range, but we, I've seen strictures develop years later. Now, there's typically something else that's going on that, that leads to that. Dehiscence tends to be earlier, and then malacia tends to occur even much later. And we've seen malacia even years after transplant. Just a few pictures. Again, to make sure everybody's still paying attention, we'll, we'll keep you uh, entertained with some nice pictures. Normal, healthy, left and right lung transplants. Uh, and then an example of necrosis. Now, necrosis is not necessarily a complication. Uh, most airways are going to have some degree of complication as they go through this, and it's going to be early in the healing phase. It will typically improve, and typically improve quickly in the first few weeks. And if you think about it, it's logical because the airway has to get better, it has to stop necrosing, or it's going to fall apart. So uh, there's a temporal association with it, and that's been shown in several studies. Early necrosis tends to get better. However, in patients that have strictures, have a higher level of necrosis in the early stages. So we're going to change gears a little bit here and, and talk about how do we classify airway complications. So early on, there was necrosis and dehiscence classification. Uh, and this was basically broken up into three grades. What would make sense and what's most important on this slide is that the worst grade, the more likely you're going to have airway complications down the line. So someone who has more necrosis early on, that person was more likely to have a complication later in their transplant history. This has been modified multiple times. And this is uh, from a publication from Dr. Mehta in uh, Santa Cruz. Uh, and it was in the Blue Journal, I believe. And, and they did some modifications on the early uh, classification of airway complications. And I'm not going to go through all this, and the slides are going to be available to come back and review. Uh, and more recently, something called the MDS classification. This came from a fantastic guy named uh, Hervé Duteau, who's in Marseille. Uh, he and his group looked at airway complications. They broke it down into three different categories, a macroscopic, a diameter, and a suture or dehiscence side. And they broke each of these down so that you can see a normal response and then gradations later, which they quantified uh, for an M0, M1, M2, M3, D0, D1, D2, and so on. Uh, and again, I'm not going to go through all these, but we'll show you some examples in the next couple slides. So this is the M. And you can see in the very top, that's a healthy looking anastomosis. If every anastomosis looked like this in our transplant group, uh, I would have significantly less work to do. Moving on to the next one, now we see some areas of protruding cartilage here and here in particular. Now that can be related to a size mismatch or just in some of the healing and suturing process. These tend not to be much of an issue. As we get down a little further, we're now seeing a little bit of inflammatory granulomas developing at the anastomosis, as you can see over here. 
again, um, these can generally be handled fairly well. And then over here, you see a pretty significant ischemic or necrotic airway uh, as the M3. We move on to the D, and again, top left is just a, a fantastic looking airway um, with a normal to less than one third fixed production and diameter. D1 deals with malacia primarily, and you see more than a 50% expiratory reduction. And down further, we see fixed reduction more in the stenosis or scar area, and in this one, it falls in that one to two thirds range of the D2. And then over here, more than two thirds with a more significant obstruction. You can see the amount of scar tissue that's developed, really from this lumen down to the suture here, whereas here we're talking about a much smaller area of, of scar. As we move on to the S, no dehiscence, sutures are all nice and tight, that's a great looking airway. We see a small dehiscence down here, less than 25% of the overall diameter. Now a larger dehiscence, this is in the 25 to 50% range, and then really a massive dehiscence, and this is truly a disaster where you see the dehiscence being as large or larger than the actual airway wall. And many centers have adopted the MDS uh, in how they quantify their bronchoscopy, uh, and I think it really has been a, a fantastic advancement. With that said, the ISHLT has recently assembled a task force and working on putting together uh, a position paper that's going to go through all airway transplant complications. And again, a busy slide, but this is just to show you there's, there's groups from all ends. There's surgeons, uh, there are pure transplant docs, transplant docs that also do interventional like Maria, uh, folks that aren't smart enough to do transplant and just do interventional stuff like me, and then mixes all around. And it's an international community, people that have got some really fantastic experience in transplant and in airways in particular, uh, the, the date of the release is still pending, as you guys all know. Anytime there's a task force put together, things move slower than we all hope they will. But we're, we're close to getting something put together and getting released now. So hopefully you'll hear that in 2017. To take us into the next question, 60-year-old guy, UIT, he had a bilateral sequential lung transplant. Surgery post-op were unremarkable, and post-op day nine he sent home. Two weeks later, he's in for his uh, outpatient clinic, his routine visit, and doing well. However, his pre-visit chest x-ray showed a 20% bilateral apical pneumothorax. He's admitted a one-sided chest tube was placed on the right side. That's where they felt they had uh, more of an issue uh, after the surgery. However, that tube continued with a continuous leak. So what would the proper management be for this patient? Follow clinically until resolution. This is most likely related to rejection, so we need to increase his immunosuppression. Put in another chest tube, perform a bronchoscopy to inspect the airway, and perform a bronchoscopy to rule out rejection. And I'll say that there are two answers here that I think are acceptable. One that is um, what I feel is the most correct, and Phil knows what I'm talking about. So does Ali. Russ already saw the answer, so we're not going to give him any credit for the right answer here. I'm not cheating and not trying. <laughs> so you guys have it. Perform a bronchoscopy for airway inspection. The other one that I think is, is could be considered would be uh, placement of the chest tube because it's possible that there are two separate right and left sided problems going on. But what we're trying to get at here is to make you think about the hissence as the anastomotic complication here. This can be absolutely catastrophic. It's difficult to treat, has significant morbidity and mortality associated with it. If you look here in this CAT scan, what you can see right up here is a pocket of air outside of where the airway should be. And that's a clue that you've got a dehiscence. Down here, obviously, bronchoscopy is the gold standard for diagnosing this. You can see this airway is just falling apart, and this is going to be uh, one bear to, to manage moving forward. Uh, it's typically in the post-op period, and ischemia infection are the most likely reasons that that happens. Now, if you have someone who is difficult weaning, they're dyspneic, they've got chest pain, pneumothorax, that's not unusual after a lung transplant, but if that persists, particularly the pneumothorax or pneumomediastinum, that's when you've got to keep this in mind because the best way to diagnose this is going to be from direct visualization with bronchoscopy. Uh, this is an example of a, a very large dehiscence that we had at our center a few years ago, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about this management technique, which is a non-covered stent to avoid opening this patient back up. Now, the next type of complication we'll touch on is infectious. As mentioned, this is a contaminated space, both from the native lung as well as the donor. 
and then in many cases as an intussusceptive bronchus where this contamination is trapped in between. The patients are immunosuppressed, they don't have a good cough reflex, they're all in pain, and they've got a devascularized ischemic area. So this is that setup for any kind of complication. So typical hospital-acquired infections need to be top on the list, Pseudomonas, Staphylococcus, uh, Aspergillus in particular. You see a great example of Aspergillus niger up here. Uh, and then other rare ones. This is one of Dr. Mehta's favorites, Pseudoalisheria voidii. Uh, and then others, Cladosporium, Canada, anything that you can think of may infect a lung transplant patient. So this needs to be kept in mind, and frequent sampling when you have an area and anastomosis that doesn't look healthy is really something that should be uh, considered uh, paramount. When we look at the mechanical complications, we have strictures, and here you see a pretty dense scar-like stricture. Another example, more stitchical, and this is more of a web-like, so this one is going to be a much easier to handle stenosis than this one. Malacia, uh, and then exophytic granulation tissue on both sides, which can lead to complete obstruction, as it did in that transplant patient. Uh, the granulation tissue is something that's typically going to occur early. I will say, if you see it later, have a higher suspicion for infection going on in that situation. So infection is one of the most likely causes, however, this is another likely cause you see right here, loose sutures, anything that is uh, interfering the airway. Obviously, someone has a stent in place that needs to be considered as well. And typical debulking uh, is, is the best way to do it. Debulking could be mechanical, just purely with forceps. Uh, it could be with other modalities. Uh, again, there's no data on this. This is, is purely my opinion, but there, there is some data that suggests cryotherapy may cause less scar in the airway after the fact, so I would urge you to consider using cryotherapy in these situations as opposed to just using argon and, and potentially potentially uh, ex expanding injury in, in those cases. Again, as I said, I don't have randomized studies on that. Uh, it's, it's mostly from experience and in, uh, in, in speaking with other folks. Now, the most common complication we're going to see is a stricture or stenosis at the anastomosis. Now, this can be at the anastomosis, as we see here, the right main stem with a really tight stricture sitting here. This is the most common. One and a half to one third of all patients can develop it, typically in the first two to nine months. And we know that if we see necrosis or dehiscence, that tends to portend this to be a worse complication. Infections can do that as well, particularly aspergillus. And multiple interventions may lead to increased strictures as well. It can be at the anastomosis, as you see here. It can be just distal to the anastomosis right here. This is the bronchus intermediate in a, a phrase that was coined uh, by Tometa, the vanishing bronchus syndrome. And we've seen some patients where they show up, this airway is just completely obliterated. Even cases where uh, people have looked at the right upper lobe and thought they were looking at the right upper lobe, bronchus intermediate, middle and lower lobes just from up in here, because this had been so grown over, you couldn't even tell there was an airway there. So uh, keep that in mind as a possibility. Uh, and then even more distal airways uh, can be affected. We're seeing that at a higher level, probably because we're transplanting more marginal patients, but we're seeing strictures in the upper lobes, into the middle lobes, into the medial and lateral segments, down into the basilar segments on both sides and uh, as well on the left. This uh, is a lung transplant patient that showed up after uh, probably being managed inappropriately elsewhere. You see how dense this scar is. So this, this is what I'm concerned about when we talk about just wide spray of heat energy and, and argon on some of these airways because we're exposing the whole anastomosis to heat and heat injury. So if we do need to heat or cut something, uh, most, most folks feel trying to cut it in as small an area as possible with the laser, with a cautery blade, and, and then going on to a blood dilation. Uh, mechanical dilation is needed in almost all of these cases endobronchial electrosurgery, and that can include laser, and then in some cases, stenting as well, and we'll touch on, on these in a little bit. Malacia can be a problem because of mucus issues, and that sets people up for infection. They can't clear the mucus. It, it certainly is a great nidus for bacteria to set up. If, um, if we're looking at uh, cough, dyspnea, quality of life, the multiple ways this can be treated, uh, positive airway pressure, in some cases stenting, Surgery is always uh, on the table. However, going back into a chest that's already had surgery is not an ideal situation, so that's not done very often. 
when do we think about airway complications? We have a drop in spirometry. Someone has symptoms, more mucus, they're short of breath, they're wheezing, they've got a cough or tightness or abnormal flow loops. Well, that can also be rejection. That can also be infection. So the flow loops may show us some information. We may see a, a dip or a biconcave uh, appearance to it. But in these cases, the surveillance bronch is almost always going to be done, whether it's for infection or for rejection, and that also gives us a, a, a look at the airway. If we see pneumomediastin or, or pneumothorax, when we, we look at their imaging, that may give us a clue that there might be a problem, particularly dehiscence. So keep that in mind. Sub-Q emphysema, bronchial wall defects on the CAT scan. Chest x-rays will show us some, but uh, if we really want to get into the airway issue, a CT scan is probably going to be more useful in those situations. But ultimately, bronchoscopy is going to be the gold standard. Now, we can debride with forceps, with the rigid scope, with the microdebrider, particularly for the exuberant granulation tissue that we showed earlier. Balloon dilation is going to be used in almost all cases of stricture or stenosis or scope dilation. And, you know, the usual argument of balloon versus scope can, can be inserted here. The cautery knife or cautery blade is, is a tool that I just find to be fantastic. And if anyone has questions about this afterwards, we'd be happy to talk about it. APC is used, again, caution when you're using a heat energy that we're, we're not exposing too much of the airway to the heat, and then cryotherapy, particularly in cases of granulation tissue. Uh, cryospray is something that's talked about a lot. We don't have a whole lot of data on that, and I would also caution the use of that in many cases because the, the safety of that has not yet been established, uh, so we still need to get a little more information on that side of it. Steroid injection is often done, antiproliferative like mitomycin. In rare cases, there are reports of PDT, and, and we did this once when I was uh, a fellow at Penn, but that's a pretty rare situation. Uh, and then stent placement, and we'll talk about the different types of stents in a little bit. Uh, so we have self-expandable metal stents, and the most common one out there uh, are these two, the Ultraflex and the Aero, and there are some others, and uh, they vary in America versus uh, in Europe uh, or elsewhere. Balloon expandable metal stents, such as the ICAT stent, and we'll touch on that in a little bit, uh, as well as silicone stents, which uh, most people feel are uh, the best way to go about handling some of this. And many of these patients, if you keep in mind, are going to be traked for a period of time, so stenosis is not uncommon. So Montgomery T-tubes can come into play, and we'll touch on that in just a little bit. The polyflex stents, which uh, have a limited role, uh, the dynamic white, Y-shaped stents, like the Tritag stent, uh, may also be used in some cases. I, I don't think we have enough time for me to go into a lot of detail about the different kinds of stents. I know you guys have had talks about that in this webinar series, so we're going to go over these slides pretty quickly. But the typical cylindrical wire mesh, and these could be deployed over a wire using fluoro or under direct visualization through a rigid bronchoscope or with a flexible scope on the side. Now, I don't completely believe this statement, but I think we need to keep in mind that stents can have a lot of problems. And when we're talking about immunosuppressed patients, we do need to be careful who we stent and what kind of stent we use. Because a stent is easy to put in does not mean that's the best stent that should be used. If we're using metal stents, keep in mind fracture, granulation tissue, embedment into the airway, and difficulty of removal later on. So we need to keep that in mind when we're deciding what we're going to use. Uh, this is a newer stent. It's been around uh, less than a decade, probably more in the five or six year range. It's made by Atrium called the ICAST, and it gets a name um, from the film cast encapsulation technology. Uh, so it's basically just a, a covered stainless steel stent. But what's nice about these stents is they can fit through the working channel of a therapeutic scope. They're small, and they can be used in smaller airways, in low bar, in sub-segments. Uh, and uh, in the most recent issue, the upcoming issue of JOBIP, what you're going to see is uh, two different articles on use of this stent, uh, predominantly in lung transplant patients, from our institution and the Harvard group as well. Uh, there's probably about 75 patients that are included in those, so just look for that in the JOBIP. Uh, it, they're, they're both pretty good articles um, at the risk of sounding um, a little uh, self-promotion there. Um, silicone stents, most uh, IP folks think these are the better stents in benign airway diseases, but there's a lot of debate as to which is best. Metal stents have much more flexibility and can conform to the different contours of transplant airways, which silicone stents can't do. So I think you just need to be flexible as to which type of stent you're going to use. And 
uh, even in the patient, that may change. And you're going to see some examples of that later. I mentioned the Montgomery T2 both for subglottic and tracheal stenosis, but there are also reports of it being used uh, in the bronchus intermedius, right upper lobe, right main stem. Uh, and there's some nice publications where that stent had uh, a lot of utility. Um, so keep in mind when we're putting in stents, if they develop problems on the edges of them, the solution is not to put in more stents. And that's, that's where this comes in here. Now, this is taken from a cardiac uh, stenosis uh, comment, but it plays a good role for us as well. But what we did see here, technical success in all of the cases was significant immediate release of the dyspnea. Uh, proven in the FEV1. However, there are complications. Any stent we put in we can lead to complications in that patient. Migration, granulation, um, and maybe you need to, to remove the stent. You may have to replace the stent. Stents can fracture. So all of that needs to be kept in mind. And uh, what we often say is when you put a stent into a patient, you become married to that patient. So you're going to have to follow that patient pretty closely. Uh, this is a more recent publication, again by the good Dr. Duto, uh, looking at 117 lung transplant patients. And they had 17 of those. So again, somewhere in that 15% range for airway complications. And what we saw were obstructive granulomas. So silicone stents can still cause these. Um, we needed to have laser resection, stent replacement. Some of the stents plugged. There's migration in some cases. So although we can improve the FEV1 significantly, get improvement in how patients do and get some patients stent free, we still need to keep in mind that stents can cause problems. And we shouldn't put stents in without giving consideration to it. The complications of airway procedures for anastomotic complications include everything from significant mucosal or anastomotic injury. And I've seen cases where someone has torn completely through the anastomosis because of um, non-careful dilation, particularly with the rigid scope. Uh, perforated distalization of airways, gas in the cases of argon, pneumothoraces, significant sloughing can be associated with cryotherapy. Same thing with, with photodynamic therapy as well as the photosensitivity and then mucosal injury, bleeding. And there are case reports, and we've reported at our institution as well, of massive fatal hemophysis at the anastomosis from associated metal stents at the anastomosis, and in some cases, a metal stent associated with fracture. So uh, keep in mind that anything we do may have significant outcome for the patient, and not necessarily in the way we want it. Uh, most Simple situation is a, is a BI stenosis, so you see a pretty tight stenosis here, just distal to the airway. Now, here are two cautery cuts. So again, what I like about the cautery blade is the injury and the heat is, is fairly localized. We get a nice cut, we make a nice stretch, and then we go from a tight airway to a decent sized airway right here. This should be the first thing you do. Try to cut and dilate whatever your modality may be, not jumping to a stent first. Stents may need to happen. In the case of Malaysia, this is a patient who failed positive pressure ventilation, recurrent pneumonias, intractable cough. But if you think about the left main stem, the left main stem is not a straight shot. So it's got a curve to it. So what we had to do here was suture two stents together to approximate the bend in that left main stem with the notch taken out to allow for good air and mucus clearance in the left upper lobe and left lower lobe, and then having it come all the way to the end of the main carina, not obstructing the right main stem. Uh, again, the left upper lobe and sub-segments of the left upper lobe were often taught that it was useless or, or not worth it to try and salvage those. Uh, again, as that ICAST paper will show you, patients have significant improvement. And this, if you look here, is the distal left main stem. This is where the left upper lobe should be. It's completely occluded. After some effort, it was recovered, balloon dilated, stent placed, and we can see apical posterior and lingula straight ahead. This is now looking down at the left lower lobe into the left lower lobe proper and the superior segment here. Uh, BI, right middle, right lower lobe stenosis. A very tight bronchus intermedius, narrowed, chronically scarred right middle, right lower lobe proper, soup seg. And this is the ICAS stent. And we have a video on this a little bit later to show you sort of how we get to that point, as long as we have time for it. A dehiscence. What's important about this one, I was called to the bedside the day after Christmas, uh, about seven years ago. The surgeons, and not knocking the surgeons, but they called me because it completely obstructed bronchus intermedius. Well, this is actually the dehiscence. And what the obstructed bronchus uh, intermedius was was actually mediastinal tissue. You look closely, you can see 
this is where the airway is supposed to be. And all of this is displaced airway that should be covering this. Metal stent went in, and this was in the Blue Journal several years ago, 2006, I believe. Uh, if you put in a non-covered metal stent, keep it in somewhere between two and four weeks, allow the granulation tissue to form, which is caused by the non-covered metal stent, remove the metal stent, often replacing it and removing it again, that can lead to significant improvement in the dehiscence in most cases and avoiding surgery. Uh, we haven't had to go back in for surgical dehiscence in, in quite a long time in our institution. Now, as I mentioned, dehiscence can lead to stricture. So this is the overgrowth. The stent was removed, but subsequently the patient developed a stricture, which then led to a silicone stent being placed with a notch cut so the upper lobe could ventilate and drain. Uh, so we went from this dehiscence, where the airway should be, to where the patient is now. Now, moving forward, as we understand a little more about rejection, about our donors, about how we handle the organs, and about our post-op management, we hope that we're going to reduce airway complications. Um, may cryotherapy play a bigger role? We're working on developing registries so we can get more data, uh, and then improve stents, whether the stents be drug-eluting, absorbable, customized, uh, patient-specific, and at our institution we're doing some work using CAT scans to make a 3D model of an airway and then use a 3D printer to make a mold where we can custom fit an airway uh, and a stent to, to minimize uh, negative interactions of the stent in the airway. And so far we've only done two patients that have had phenomenal results. Our first patient is about a year out right now. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll see something uh, in the literature about that soon. And working with societies like the IFHLP to get standardized grading systems as we move forward. Um, we think we have, I think we have a little time, Russ, to uh, to just go through this one case here. This is a patient that had. Oh, absolutely, a, a, yeah. Um, yeah, this will be about five minutes, and then we'll open up the questions. So, we had a bilateral sequential lung transplant, dehiscence, um, managed with self-expandable metal stent. It healed after about two months. Developed a stricture. He had multiple dilations, trying to avoid a stent eventually had to get a stent. And then this poor guy uh, developed a small cell carcinoma in his right lower lobe. Got chemo and XRT. That, uh, the XRT in particular probably added to some strictures, so his right middle and right lower lobe stricture down a little more. Um, but he seemed to have beaten the small cell. So it's been three years since his diagnosis, six years since his transplant, and this is about a year old now, so, so four and seven. Uh, and we developed, developed this custom stenting in vivo approach you'll see here, and we'll go on to the video. Um, and we could play the video now, Russ? Yeah, David, are you ready? So are you guys seeing the video? Yes. Okay, perfect. So what you have here is um, I can see the picture, but I don't see any action. Um, I'm sorry, on my screen it, it's showing. Do you want to, um, for people who are watching the video, if it's not moving on the bottom um, of the video, you actually can start and stop it with the uh, controls if you just put your mouse over top. Apologize for that. Do you have it now, Mike? I, uh, I tried it, but mine's still not moving. Okay, so I'm pausing mine because I'm I'm I, I think these are buffering and playing at the speed of each individual's uh, uh, okay well uh, uh, connections and links. Can most folks see this? If if, if folks it, can, then type in that text box. Um, I'll I'll just describe as best I can what happened. So there's one of these ICAS stents that's going to be placed in the bronchus intermedius. However, in order to get uh, the areas that are involved completely covered, we had to jail the middle lobe and superior segment. Uh, so uh, what I do is I make a mental note of where these spots are, kind of memorizing my hand position, deploy the stent, and then we use a CRE balloon to help the stent expand. Once it's in place, uh, I'll take a, a small needle. In this case, it was a Supertrax needle. Uh, and then go to the spot where I remember where the right middle lobe would be and then begin to uh, basically cut out a hole where that middle lobe will be. And 
at some point you'll see some suction coming on and the mucus coming through, and that sort of confirms we've got. We we just saw that. We just saw that part. Okay. Uh, after that, we need to make the hole a little bit bigger because the CRE balloon isn't going to fit through that just yet. So sometimes a Fogarty balloon can get right through. Sometimes we've got to use forceps, like in this case. And then we just use the forceps to uh, to basically dig out the hole a little bit. Once I can get that dug out, I get a four uh, or a red Fogarty in there and get a little dilation, which is enough to allow an and CRE balloon to sneak through. Once that gets through, a dilation uh, happens. And then we follow this with another eye cast. In this case, it was a 7 by 22. Leave a little bit of the eye cast out into the lumen of the bronchus intermediate and then deploy the stent. And as we do in other cases, follow it with a CRE balloon dilation as well. And then the nice thing about this balloon is you can flange those edges out. I don't know if you've gotten to that point yet, but you'll see the forceps come back in at some point. And then um, I'll just kind of pinch that edge over to allow for a nice tight seal at that middle lobe RC2 carina, not to impact any mucus coming from the lower lobes. The same thing is done in the superior segment, uh, but not included in this video. And then at the end, you'll see kind of everything all done together. Um, and with this, you know, this patient has had this done on two occasions over the past 18 months. Uh, so not frequent um, and been able to manage this pretty well. But this has helped keep all of these segments patent and keep this guy at home, uh, although he does have to come in for a bronch every three to four months um, for some stent maintenance and touch up here and there. But uh, we've used this in a few patients, and for really complex multi-level strictures and stenoses, uh, it, it's been something that we have found invaluable. Um, these stents are cheap, so um, we try not to, to use them if we don't have to, but in some cases it really seems to be the only option. How are we on the video right now, guys? Video just ended, and it was playing uh, on time with your description. Okay. Like I've seen it okay, before. Okay, so, uh, David, will you pass control back? Uh, yeah, I'll take it back whenever you can. Just going to pass control and just load his next set of slides. Okay. Uh, again, not going to go through all of this. This is uh, an algorithm that uh, has been published um, looking at management of anastomotic complications. I think the, you know, the important, important parts are um, some people are going to be asymptomatic. You don't have to work on every single anastomosis. Every anastomosis should not be stented, um, but some will require stenting. So try dilation first. If unsuccessful, you've got other options to go to, but always think about what the next step or the next steps may be moving forward. You don't want to box yourself into a corner in a situation where you can't get a metal stent out. I'm still seeing patients uh, up to two weeks ago that are showing up with non-covered metal stents embedded in their airways, and that's just something that shouldn't happen. Remember, 2005, right? It was a FDA black box warning about non-covered metal stents uh, in the airways. Uh, so that's all I've got right now. Um, if there are some questions for any of you, I'm happy to entertain those. And hopefully this was enjoyable to you. And I want to thank the AABIP for uh, honoring me with, uh, with this talk. I, I'm, I feel privileged that they chose me to do it. Mike, that was um, excellent. So anybody that has questions, if you could please type them into the chat box, um, and we will order them, um, answer them in the order that they come in. Uh, while we're waiting for the first one, I just have a quick one. Um, the ICAST stent, I had the opportunity to come and watch you use it a few times. And I know that Arrow and uh, Boston Scientific are working on some mini stents as well. Do you think that the stainless steel where you're able to put the hole in it is the main advantage, or is it simply the size of the stents that you think make it work so well in your particular patient? Uh, yes. I think, I think it's a little bit of both. So. The size of the stents has really been something that's, that's been fantastic. Um, uh, using these, and I've used these, um, you know, fairly distal in, in several cases. And the size, they, they come in 5, 6, 7 millimeter, and 16 and 22 or 17 and 22 millimeter for the length. So, so they're really small. Now, you've got to be careful because you put these a little too distal, they get sucked back. They may be very difficult or impossible to remove. So that needs to be kept in mind. But they can stent low bar and subsegment airways and, and really improve someone's functional capacity immensely. 
But I also think there's something about the stainless steel. That stainless steel really allows you to contort it and allow it to fit um, a non-round airway much better than the other metal stents that are out there. And we've been able to really uh, play with these stents, flange the ed edges, flange a little bit in the middle or a little bit in the end, and then also the advantage of being able to poke a hole and place another stent through it, which you can't do with the others. Thanks for that. Um, uh, does anybody have any questions? If if not, we'll be um, ending shortly. Um, again, I wanted to thank you. That was an excellent uh, talk, Mike. Um, give it about one more minute. While we're waiting, I will also uh, chime in for the group that um, the next webinar will, you should be seeing a, an email alert uh, next month. It'll be Monday, the uh, February 13th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That will be Mike Simoff, and he's from Henry Ford Medical Center. He will be discussing uh, choosing between different endobronchial ablation therapies. Oh, okay. I guess you covered everything, uh, Dr. Matusak. So, um, unless uh, David, you have anything else? I think we'll. Um, no, but I do appreciate the, again. Thank you very much for your time, Dr. Matusak, and uh, it was a very thorough and comprehensive discussion. And, uh, the last slide. I've got my email on. If, if anyone has questions that pop up later, feel free. Thank you. Right. I'm going to turn Thank off you. the recording. All right. Have a good night.